Welcome back to the channel. So over the last few videos, I've looked at this photo library tool that I've put together to replace Apple Photos for me because primarily Apple Photos has no culling tools. It has no meaningfully useful tools to help me curate my own library, which is, it has one job to do and it fails miserably on that front. So I built this, which has full culling tools and just this fantastic approach of uh, respecting the file system uh, origins of my albums and, and where the images are actually on my file system and just provides this sort of uh, progressive enhancement front-end experience for working with those images and it's absolutely amazing so do check out those other videos that I've looked in more detail about the, the overall approach and why it exists and what kind of features I've put into it in this video I'm going to just do a little bit of a closer look at the actual open source projects that power this because um, I, I sort of haven't done a lot of detail on those in the other videos but also I'm going to use that as a way of kind of um, framing what I've done here because I think a lot of people are um, sort of thinking I'm, I'm doing this you know my own way and using AI and, and sort of it seems disrespectful to the open source approach and all of this that's not true at all it, it uses the open source libraries to power this is it's they're essential to this and I have the, the biggest respect for those projects and I'd love to be personally involved with uh, contributing to those and as time goes on hopefully I can achieve that as well um, all I've done is just put this personal front end on those tools and and that's I think always been the bit that's missing from the open source community you have these incredible powerful tools command line interfaces but you have to use them over the command line or if there is a front end for them, they're really clunky and, you know, sort of try to do everything to all people because, of course, that's how this has to work up until now. Uh, you know, you have a, a project, someone's got to design the features in the software and hope it's useful to the audience. Well, now you can build your own software specifically for your own requirements. That, that personal element, what it is, the interface, the workflow is now no longer needing to be designed by someone in the hope that it can be useful for someone else person who is using it can design it themselves that's all that's going on here i think this is quite an interesting new way of thinking about this whole approach and i think actually it's giving amazing power to those open source projects because it's, it's giving a broader audience to them. more people can now use them in a real day-to-day -day workflow and that's fantastic um, so first of all we'll just look at how this works on the back end so the first thing that happens is essentially I've got this master photo library folder. This is where all of my originals are, the JPEGs and the RAWs that come out of the camera. I just chuck them in here, uh, put every time I sort of offload from the SD card, I make a new folder and, and I chuck the files in there. And then I have a, an import script and that will scan for new files. I can point it at a folder just to speed things up a little bit as well. And it will extract metadata from those files and it will create a row in the database. So I sort of import this. So I have a database, which is SQLite. Um, we can find the actual file for that somewhere here. We image metadata there. Um, that's where everything is stored, all the metadata, all of the indexing and everything is done for the whole library in there. And what happens as part of that import process is, is it obviously adds to the database, but it also generates thumbnails. Um, and obviously for, for images, we can just use the, uh, I've got a sort of um, documentation for, for how it actually does that. So we've got this generate thumbnails function here, and we can see that it's just using this pill uh, part of Python to do the resizing and the generation of thumbnails for images. And then we use FFmpeg to do the extraction of a frame from a video to do the same thing. So we've always got these thumbnails generated for the library. It's just such an important part of the libraries that you have ultra fast thumbnails to load. So these are WebP um, formatted compressed to the right size. Uh, obviously quality is, is not the major concern here. It's speed of loading. So they're, they're quite compressed and they're just the right size for the UI to render here at retina quality on the screen. So that's what happens when you import them. So we've got this database on the back end. The Python script deals with the processing and, and um, scans the folders, takes the EXIF data out of the files, puts it into the database and generates these thumbnails. So from there, I'm going to look at three more parts of this software, the raw processing, the video processing, and the sharing mechanism now, which I've put in place, which is fantastic. Um, lets you share an album with friends and family, which is, of course, another thing that Apple Photos does uh, try and do. And in some senses does do very well. It makes it very easy to share an album, but it's just brutal with the quality. There's, there's no 4K video sharing. The I think the JPEGs are even pretty compressed. It's just that the video certainly is is terrible when you share. Um, I just, you know, it's unusable really. I have no interest in sharing videos with my friends and family that low quality when I put all the effort into um, pursuing the, the, this lovely 4K image quality from using good cameras and, and so on. So um, I've got a full quality sharing mechanism here. Here. 
and the way that works is really interesting we'll get onto that at the end so let's look at the raw processing first so we've got actually two images here i haven't culled these yet so let's just quickly demonstrate that so we can do left and right to see which one we think we want p to uh, mark that as the potential candidate and we can double check with a side by side that that is the one we want f to finalize and we can see it's marked it ready for deletion which we can then do just by using this to del delete rejected images and that will call the python script that um, will delete all the images that have been added to the json file uh, from this process so anything with the red outline has been now saved to a json file on the server ready for the script to actually go through and do the full deleting which removes the files from the galleries and removes the original puts them in the system trash in fact so it's a little bit safer there as well um, so that's the process so let's actually go into this one and we can bring up the toolbar on the right and we can see our raw processing so this hasn't been processed at all so this is the camera jpeg that we're now using as the display so the first thing we can do is open up this and we can then uh, work towards hitting the raw process button for the first time so the way this works is we have a standard and i'll get on to what that is in a minute a style and then some settings um, which are custom for each one including some white balance presets which i can save from this manual version where i can actually set the kelvin and tint values um, and then that will all send a command back to the api and then that api will run the um, raw therapy command which looks like this so we have this generate raw proxies Python script, and that basically builds this uh, command and runs it, which is the raw therapy command line. So if you download raw therapy, you get this command line interface tool as part of that. You can put that somewhere and, and obviously then the script can just reference it. So the way it works, we've got these, these P flags and these are the PP3 configuration files. So it works with a chain of three of these. The first one is the camera specific stuff. So I've set this up for the cameras that I have in my library. Um, this is obviously the default is the A7C here, but I use this with the S9 now. So I have an S9 PP3, which essentially um, sets up the base profile. Now I'm using the Cobalt imaging base profiles. They've got a really cool system where they have base profiles for all the different cameras and they'll get a consistent look out of every camera. And then they have these emulation profiles that stack on top of that. So you can take any camera and end up with the same, same output using their emulation profiles fantastic um, really impressed with what they're doing there now the way that works with Lightroom uh, is a bit simpler than the approach we have to take here using this open source version raw therapy um, so the cobalt imaging profiles in Lightroom actually reference the base profile from the profile uh, the style profile so you can actually just load those up into Lightroom and just choose the one profile which represents the, the look that you want and it will reference the base profile automatically we have to approach this a little bit more manually in raw therapy where we actually set up the the camera profile and that's obviously the bit that goes into the first pp3 file here so let's just find our s9 one of those so we've got the raw uh, raw therapy presets folder and we can see our s9 pp3 file so the lens i use most of the time with this camera is, is uh, set up in here and then we can see this is the base kind of setting this includes all the sharpening and stuff which is obviously tuned to the, the sensor on this camera, I've gone through and sort of fiddled with that in the actual raw therapy application to work out what settings I want. And if we search for the profile, we can see the color management thing here, which is where it references the Cobalt Imaging base profile for the Lumix S9. Um, so then if we look at the second flag here, this is this temp dynamic one. So all of the options from here go into the Python script, which generates on the fly each time this dynamic PP3 file. And if we just jump out, we can see that file in particular, and that's going to contain all of the settings that reference um, the values I set up in the interface there. So here's the temp dynamic file, and we can see obviously we've got the section for exposure and the value in there is, is going to be sort of generated from the value that is selected in the interface here. And we can see the same with the white balance and, and all the rest of it. So that's that dynamic one. And then we've got the third PP3, which is the style one. And that very simply just literally references the the cobalt um, LUT for that emulation profile. So, so with co if you are using cobalt images with this raw therapy workflow, you actually need the LUT version from them for these styles. Don't just buy the normal one. You have to actually buy the LUT version. And then you can convert the cube LUT files to the HALD C LUT format, which is what raw therapy uses. And it goes into this film simulation mode. So this is how we can use the cobalt base profile and their style profiles in a raw therapy workflow. 
So in terms of video, I want to really make the most of this process as well. But now the library is so effortless to work with, I'm actually shooting everything in Vlog on the Lumix S9 now and um, processing each one, generating these proxies using LUTs, uh, which is fantastic because I always have that ultra high quality version and I can experiment with color and create compressed versions that perform really well for sharing and in the library as well. Um, so we use FFmpeg for that, which is the sort of you know standard open source command line tool for compressing video and it supports LUTs as well, which is really cool. So we've got support for two different LUT files here. We've got the, the Vlog um, D-Log version, which will take it to a sort of good base. And then we can choose the Cobalt Imaging LUT on top of that for the actual style. And we can adjust the exposure and we can trim the video on the start and the end in terms of seconds as well, which is really nice, obviously, just to be able to get that the wobbly bits from the start and the end of the clip trimmed off on the version that you use in your library and for sharing, which is fantastic. So we can see the FFmpeg command here and how it uses the um, the LUTs to, to color grade and we can stack those as well. So we've got the D-Log version and then the style one on the top. And these are the rest of the settings that I use and, and that seems to make for uh, you know good balance of quality and file size in the library there. And obviously when we generate these, the database gets updated to say that we're using the proxy version that's automatically switched out in the interface then and automatically tries to play the proxy when it exists. So the next thing I'm just going to touch on is the sharing system. So when we're viewing an album now or a gallery, we can actually just very easily now use this share uh, option, which will call a script on the back end. And that generates a static folder containing all of the images or videos uh, from that album and creates a single static folder, which we can then just push up, up, up to a VPS somewhere so that we can share these with friends and family. And obviously you can put password protection on the VPS, um, Apache config or whatever, however you set that up. But the point is this is a static folder uh, with its own index.html and all the files needed for it. But the really cool thing about this is when they're generated on my hard drive, the files are actually sim links to the originals uh, in the in the hard link gallery. So it's automatically the, the proxy switching is done at the hard link gallery stage. So those files are automatically always using the right version. If they get updated, this sim link will also be updated. So with one rsync command, I can quickly just push all of these shared folders and update them if I change, you know, just automatically just keep that up to date um, on the VPS from these shared folders. And this is just fantastic. And this is the rsync command that actually um, deals with that symlink setup. This is the L flag is the key, the capital L flag in the rsync command. That will look at the symlink in the local version and make sure it uses the real file when it uploads um, to the VPS. So this is just fantastic. These shared albums don't use any additional storage on my own machine. They're completely static and portable um, and can be just automatically synchronized up to the VPS for sharing. So this is just a really excellent element of this software um, and just works so well. So the HD and they're obviously just basically a cut down version of the interface um, for here just for read only and display uh, works with the images and videos but it all, the nice thing is how it uses the symlink to the version that I use in my hard link galleries which is automatically switching to the proxy file if needed and all the rest of it so they will always use the right version the most up-to-date version if I regenerate any of these proxies I haven't got to do anything those shared folders are always kept up to date and can be synchronized with the VPS just with that single rsync command um, and it will just work really well so if you're building your own tool, hopefully this has been useful just to sort of see how I've set this up from a technical perspective with those powerful tools behind the scenes. And hopefully it's also demonstrated a little bit how my approach here isn't really competing with that open source world at all. In fact, it's only it's sort of amplifying it in that I'm suggesting anyone can now build their own custom tool to utilize these fantastic projects. And hopefully that means those projects will get more exposure as a result, which is only a good thing for the open source community. Um, the way I see it, uh, you know, I'm not creating new commercial software either here is not, you know, I'm not sort of uh, taking away from the open source approach there either. This is just, it's so specific to my requirements. And I think everybody will have their own take on this. And if they're making their own personal versions of these applications, they're, they're just going to be their own version. Like that's it. That's the end. Of it. This is the new way of thinking about software. We can all make our own workflow specific um, front ends to these amazing open source projects that provide all that incredible power on the back end. So if you're interested in how you can use AI to do this yourself with your own version, just check out the video on the screen now where I do a full real time demonstration of how I used Claude code to actually write this, this, this front end software here. Um, fascinating. I didn't write one line of code for this and you can see just how amazing the project is. So I'll see you there.